लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आए सैयद मोहम्मद मीसम अलॉन्ग विद माई को होस्ट जुबिया आरिफ फील प्रिवलेज टू वेलकम यू ऑल एट द थर्ड सेशन ऑफ द इंटरनेशनल मेरी टाइम कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द नेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मेरी टाइम अफेयर्स अंडर द पेट्रनेज ऑफ द पाकिस्तान नेवी विच इज बींग कंडक्टेड टू डिलिबरेट ऑन द सब्जेक्ट ऑफ एम्ब्रेसिंग ब्लू इकोनमी चैलेंजेस एंड ऑपरचुनिटीज फॉर डिवेलपिंग कंट्रीज The theme selected for deliberation in this session is ocean biogeosciences and marine technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral retired Irfan Ahmed Hilali Amtiaz Military Sitara Jurrat has consented to be the honorable chief guest in this session. Please welcome the session's honorable chief guest, Vice Admiral retired Irfan Ahmed Hilali Amtiaz Military Sitara Jurrat. Ladies and gentlemen we now request Commodore retired Said Mohammad Ubaidullah Sitar Imtiaz Military to introduce our chief guest Bismillah Rahman Rahim uh respected panel distinguished distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen on behalf of NIMA it is my proud privilege and a singular honor to welcome Commer admiral irfan ahmed him sj he has been very very kind that at the last minute he accepted to be the chief guest of the session as senator shahri rahman had to go for another commitment sir we are very grateful to you for accepting our request to be the chief guest and what a person like you most suited to the occasion we are very grateful a big hand of applause for admiral irfan please <laughs> admiral irfan has over 40 years of naval career a distinguished and meritorious career of the service and within which he had been both afloat and ashore in the shore appointments distinguished appointment that he had held was commanding officer karsaz a different thing from today's when the technical officers are there as commanding officer commanding officer himalaya and many other areas and then in the naval headquarters into various different capacity as dno and director personnel deputy chief of naval staff projects and at sea he has commanded uh, moaven he has commanded uh, togrul and he has been combed as around so with these all appointment and finally just before retirement he was md behria foundation as a person what a splendid person he is we have his uh, blessing while we live in navy housing scheme and he is the president and treats us very well i am sure those who living in uh, nhs clifton would bear me out Admiral Irfan, along with Admiral Shahid Karimullah, Commodore Ubaidullah, Commodore Rashidullah, and three more Ullas, we have been together into shrimp farming, which was mentioned in the morning session. So I propose the name of that company as Ulla Farms, and requested Admiral Irfan also to add Ulla after his name, which he very kindly accepted. Uh, Admiral has. uh so decorated but particularly i would like to mention he took part in 1971 war and and to acknowledge his services and his valiant work he was awarded sitara e jurrat sir i welcome you here and just before i leave in this afternoon session i would like just two minutes or maybe one minute of this joke which is very relevant here i we have seven moderators in this session yesterday today and tomorrow and all moderators have been given a 5 minutes talk in the beginning i was given 15 minutes of talk and also after this i have been told to stand here and also introduce admiral irfan which was of course my privilege but this reminds me ke ek dafa ye hua Sorry foreigners I have to narrate this in Urdu 
एक शायर ने अपना एक शेर पढ़ा और उस शेर में बड़ी वाह वाह हुई वाह 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 मुकर्र मुकर्र उसने फिर दोबारा वही शेर पढ़ दिया फिर बड़ी वाह वाह हुई मुकर्र मुकर्र उसने कहा भाई आगे भी पढ़ूं कि यही सुनाता रहूं सारे क्राउड ने मिल कहा जब तक इसी शेर को सही से नहीं सुनाओगे यही सुनाते जाओगे तो दैट्स वाई आई एम हियर थैंक यू Thank you sir ladies and gentlemen we are privileged to have dr samina kidwai director general national institute of oceanography as the moderator for the session dr samina kidwai is the current director general at the national institute of oceanography having spent 26 plus years at the national institute of oceanography and with more than 15 years of post doctoral experience She is the recipient of several national international prizes including the Star Washington Young Scientist Special Commendation Award and the International Human Dimensions Program on Global Environment Change the International Geosphere Biosphere Program and the World Climate Change Research Program for her publications She has more than 60 scientific publications and more than 200 days of sea time experience We now hand over the mic to the session moderator Dr Samina Kidwai for further proceedings. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sudri wa yassir li amri wa halal ugdatum min lisani yafqahu qawli. We will begin uh, this uh, almost evening's uh, session. Uh, I am not going to set the scene because I think uh, much has been said already. so with your permission we will go right into our talks uh, introducing uh, the session uh, we have four uh, speakers today for this session uh, it is the hardest to speak at the end and it's also the end of the day so it's a it's a challenge for all of us but our two speakers are uh, virtual speakers and they are online and they've been waiting for a long time Uh, our first speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Josh. Uh, Josh uh, has uh, a faculty position at uh, the Florida State University. Uh, he works on carbon burials in the mangroves. Has published uh, extremely uh, has published uh, in extremely high stature uh, scientific publications, uh, and. Uh, he has he's currently working on global synthesis and the the rates of carbon burial uh, in the mangrove systems let me also make this clear to you that the carbon sequestration uh, madam uh, senator had mentioned that uh, the oceans are the largest carbon sink carbon dioxide sink uh, the mangroves uh, sequester almost 40% 40 times more carbon than other forests so uh, the mangroves are extremely important to us uh, josh is uh, a collaborator with the national institute of oceanography and uh, without uh, delaying any further we will ask josh if he would like to uh, to present online uh, if he's available or we have his recorded uh, uh, talk as well So Josh uh, if you are online would you like to uh, do a live session or would you like us to run your uh, presentation for you I I think for the state of the internet connection I think it would be best to go with the recorded talk right. because I'm having some spotty connection All right. Uh, we will run Josh's uh, public uh, presentation for you, but he will remain online with us for those of us who would be interested in taking questions later. So, uh, can you, can we have the the presentation run, please? And we will try and make sure that the presentation times don't exceed the time that is allocated to them, so that you don't have to wait extra long for uh, for this session. So, can you please run the uh, his presentation? It's an honor to be with you, and I want to thank the conference organizers and Dr. Samina Kidvai of the Pakistan National Institute of Oceanography for inviting me to give this talk. The objective of my presentation is to talk about things that we do and don't know about mangroves and soil carbon. 
And ultimately, what I'd like to share today are some significant opportunities that I see in Pakistan for research, conservation, and mitigation against global climate change. Much of the work that I'll be presenting today is from this paper that my postdoc, Dr. Havlin Steinmuller, and I published last year in Geophysical Research Letters. And I'll provide my email address at the end of this talk, and if anyone's interested in uh, a copy of the paper, I'd be happy to send it to you. Now, I want to begin by noting that mangrove ecosystems are an integral part of the blue economy and their provision of biodiversity, including many commercially important fisheries, and for their ability to protect our shorelines, which is demonstrated in this figure, where these rising profiles here indicate a reduction of storm surge height by anywhere from 10 to 90 percent, depending on the width of the mangrove forest. Now, additionally, mangroves are extremely important for their role in global carbon sequestration and for our efforts to combat global climate change. These are two seminal figures from a decade ago that demonstrate how mangroves have higher burial rates and higher stocks than other upland systems that we think of as being so carbon rich. And blue carbon is becoming a global economic powerhouse in terms of carbon markets and credit for conservation and restoration efforts. Since 2005, the value of the global voluntary carbon market has seen some ups and downs, but it reached almost $2 billion in 2021, the latest year that totals were available for, and this is shown in that panel on the right. In the panel on the left, you can see that of the 170 different types of carbon credits that are available, blue carbon is an increasingly important part of the forestry and land use category that itself reached almost $1.3 million in 2021. I should note that I am not an economist, so this talk is gonna really focus more on the biogeochemistry. And I'm gonna specifically talk about organic carbon and coastal wetland sediments. So I wanna give you a quick explanation of how stocks and burial rates are quantified before I go on to discuss the results of our recent paper. Now, both stocks and burial rates are obtained from sediment cores, as I've shown here on the left. These examples show the diversity of soils that are found in mangroves. And in the middle, I've shown an example of a core that has a cartoon of a ruler next to it. This demonstrates that when we take cores and bring them back to the lab, what we try to do is section them and measure both the density of the sediments and the carbon content, generally to a depth of about 100 centimeters. And this is what we use for estimating uh, what the carbon stocks are for a mangrove ecosystem is generally over the top meter of soil. For burial rates, we're interested in understanding a relatively long-term average because we are interested in knowing the likelihood of the organic carbon being sequestered from the atmosphere and no longer contributing to global climate change. The image on the upper right shows a gamma detector, which is the tool that I use for detecting radioactivity of uh, elements in their natural state. And the bottom right shows a uranium-238 decay chain. And I'm primarily working with lead-210 and radium-226, which lets me establish dates in these coastal sediments over approximately the last 100 years. And so if I can establish dates for different depths of a core, then I can go in and I can calculate how much carbon has accumulated since those dates, which is also known as a burial rate. Now in the slides that follow, I'm going to present results from a literature review where we compiled recorded data from the peer reviewed literature about carbon burial rates that followed these methods. On this slide is where I start to share some of the things that we know about mangrove carbon burial. This is a histogram from the literature that reports 100 year scale burial rates of carbon in mangroves. Along the x-axis, we have the organic carbon burial rate, which is reported in grams of organic carbon per meter square per year. The y-axis then shows the number of observations that we found recorded in the literature. Now, these light gray bars represent observations from our paper that was published in 2012, and these dark gray bars represent the results from our paper that was published last year in 2022. In total, there were 65 observations for the 2012 paper, and that increased up to 205 observations last year. The first thing I want to convey in, from this data is just that there is a really wide range of carbon burial rates that can be found in mangroves around the world. And so 
even though on that earlier slide I showed that mangroves have very high burial rates on average, I want to make it clear that there are some systems where mangroves in their natural habitat are not burying very high rates. They're burying quite low, as you can see from this range, from two all the way up to 1,749 grams of carbon per meter square per year. Secondly, I want to point out that these data have a pretty heavy right skew. So there's some, some high values pushing it out to the right. And so calculating uh, an average of this data set would be um, incorrect if we just used an arithmetic mean. But what we did is used a transformed mean uh, using a fourth root transformation of the data and come up with a value of 139 grams of carbon per meter square per year, uh, representing mangroves globally. The numbers there in the parentheses then represent the 95% confidence interval. One of the advancements in our paper is that we didn't just treat all mangroves as the same. Instead, we utilized a recently developed global spatially explicit typology that was published by Worthington et al. in 2020. And we used this to assign our observed values to one of two coastal sedimentary settings, either terrigenous or carbonate. The terrigenous settings are settings like those of the Indus River Delta where the mineral sediment that's present is primarily derived from continental sources. Carbonate settings are more like where I've done a lot of my work in Florida and the Caribbean, where much of the mineral sediment is authogenic carbonate that occurs through precipitation. Now we also assigned each of the mangrove observations to one of four coastal geomorphic settings, either deltas, lagoons, estuaries, or open coasts. Here I'm showing data from that earlier histogram, but now it's broken out by sedimentary and geomorphic setting. And what's important to notice is that there are pretty broad differences in the, the range of observations and in the frequencies of those between these sedimentary and geomorphic settings. Probably the most important difference that I want you to take away from this slide is that there are very significant differences between the average burial rates for terrigenous settings, again, like those of the Indus River, which are draining continents, versus those in carbonate settings, which are almost a third lower uh, overall. So 160 grams per meter square versus 103 grams of carbon per meter square. This has important implications for global carbon budgets and for local resource managers. Instead of just focusing on a single burial rate as representative of mangrove globally, our data show that there are large differences among mangrove settings. Now, this plot is no longer reporting carbon burial on a local scale, but is instead scaled to global area of each sedimentary and geomorphic setting to produce rates that are now produced uh, representative of teragrams of organic carbon per year. And the key point here is that deltas are burying carbon much more rapidly each year than mangrove in other environments. Uh, this is globally. But the thing that's important to notice as well is that these error bars are still quite large. And that represents continued research that we need to do in deltas to improve our understanding of the sources and controls on carbon burial in these locations. This map shows all 205 locations of mangrove carbon burial that are recorded in the literature. The colors again indicate that there's a wide range of rates, but what's really surprising is the aspect of this, this figure that shows how many global locations are missing any observations. Now this includes Pakistan. To the best of my knowledge, there are no values recorded for either the deltaic or the lagoonal mangroves of Pakistan for the burial rates. Um, and so to me, this represents a, a big opportunity. Thus far, I've been talking mostly about burial rates, but I want to turn our attention for a little bit to the stocks of soil carbon, because there are estimates of soil carbon stocks that have been published for the Indus River Delta. This estimate of 180 megagrams of carbon per hectare um, has been upscaled, however, from a paper that was published in 1992 and that was using only three sediment cores that were only 20 centimeters deep. So while it's nice to have some numbers available, we should keep in mind that these are very small numbers. There's only three observations and they're from very short cores. So they have had to extrapolate both laterally within the, the wetlands 
and they've had to extrapolate from 20 centimeters down to a meter. Uh, so there's many, many uncertainties that are associated with that, that estimate. So I want to conclude my talk by suggesting that now is a great time to capitalize on the data gaps that I've identified um, in this talk. Um, and these, these unknowns represent a place where we can begin a coordinated effort to collect sediment cores from mangroves throughout Pakistan, both in the Indus Delta and in the other lagoonal settings, to expand our understanding of the stocks and the burial rates and how much carbon is present in the mangroves of Pakistan. Establishing these baselines and a foundational understanding of the sediment and soil carbon pools is fundamentally important for any blue carbon efforts that we're going to conduct in the future. And in conclusion, then, these are the four points that I hope you take away from this talk. The first is that mangroves globally bury about 139 grams of carbon per meter square per year. But it's important to remember that not all mangroves bury carbon in the same way and that terrigenous setting mangroves bury carbon considerably faster than uh, those of carbonate mangrove settings. Thirdly, deltaic mangroves bury more carbon annually than any other setting of mangroves in the world. And there's a lot that we need to do to expand our work to improve our understanding of how deltas are doing that. Lastly, there's a surprising lack of data about stocks and burial rates in Pakistan, and I think this represents a really important opportunity. I want to thank you again for this opportunity to speak with you, and I hope that in the future I can meet with you in person. I will remain online so I can join you for the question and answer period at the conclusion of this session. I would also be able, happy to answer any questions over email, uh, which you can reach me at this address. Thank you again. Thank you, Josh, uh, for that uh, uh, wonderful and concise uh, presentation. Uh, let me just um, take you back to a few uh, few points pointers that were given um, earlier by the in the earlier talks. Uh, the lack of uh, data uh, from our uh, from our region from from our country uh, is is very clear. Uh, if you make your case anywhere uh, scientifically, you will need uh, reliable data. And uh, reliable data means that you have to uh, follow set procedures that are acceptable worldwide. Um, I take the example of the Continental Self, uh, Shelf Extension uh, Project. You had to establish your case based on uh, reliable data. So the significance of data is, is uh, something that you cannot ignore. And um, the research institutions uh, that operate within Pakistan or worldwide are, uh, are equipped to do and cater to filling those gaps. And I think that's exactly what the National Institute of Oceanography and other academic institutions are doing. Research or any blue economy, uh, if you look at R&D, the development comes after the research. So uh, you do need to research before you move on to development. So with that, uh, we will move on to the second. And uh, Josh, uh, we will take the question and answers at the end of the session. We will move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker will uh, talk about ocean acidification. I think these were things that were uh, discussed in the earlier and uh, uh, Senator Sherry Rahman also uh, pointed out some of the factors uh, in her almost like a keynote uh, address. Um, we have our speaker uh, from, uh, he's, uh, his name is uh, Dr. Abid. Ar Rahman Al Hassoun. Uh, now, Dr. Abid is originally from Lebanon. Uh, he got his PhD in uh, in France, and now works in um, in uh, Geomar, Germany. So that just shows you uh, how uh, international our research has become. Uh, become. Uh, these are all issues that are go glo being globally addressed. They are all uh, issues that are relevant to every country. And like oceans have no boundaries, these issues uh, have no boundaries, and so does research. So with that, Abid, uh, it's over to you. Thanks very much for coming online and talking to us. 
So let's uh, take your presentation. Abid is going to talk about monitoring climate change, consequences in the blue economy, uh, the ocean acidification as an example. So Dr. Abid, it's to you now. Welcome. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Samina. Thank you for, for inviting me for this very interesting uh, event. It was very interesting to hear uh, George and the other speakers as well. So I'm here, uh, yeah, I'm Lebanese, I'm a Lebanese researcher, and I'm working uh, at Geomar in Kiel. As you've said, this is just to show and to reflect that, that, that actually what we are dealing with, what we are studying is something global, it's international, and uh, we need all to be involved in. So I'm gonna talk about ocean acidification, and uh, why is it really important to uh, study this phenomenon, uh, you know, to, to better implement that blue economy? So uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, climate change. So I will not so much dig into that because many, many speakers have already tackled uh, climate change in general and uh, have correlated it with the human activities, as it was mentioned clearly in the IPCC. Uh, reports uh, in general. So uh, the, our activities are the main uh, causes of the ongoing climate change and its consequences, uh, mainly industrial activities and activities related to um, uh, plant powers, etc. And one of the main gases actually that we are, we are emitting and is causing huge uh, problems in the atmosphere, but also in the oceans, is the CO2 that's coming mainly from fossil fuel burning and other industrial processes, but also because of um, the land changes, uh, terrestrial land changes as well. So if we, uh, we're gonna like compare a little bit uh, the paleontological uh, 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 concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, with regard to the current ones, we can see clearly that the, the current CO2 uh, concentrations in the atmosphere are, un, are unprecedented and they are super um, uh, um, enormous compared to, to, to uh, other uh, to, to, to millions of years before. And that's why uh, it is really uh, urgent to, to act because otherwise, uh, we are all somehow doomed. So how do we know that? Today's rate of increase is more than 100 times faster than the increase uh, previously when the last ice age uh, ended and it's it's uh, continuing. So there are actually many atmospheric monitoring uh, um, stations to, to, to monitor that different greenhouse gases uh, around the globe. One of the famous ones is in the US, in the Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And there, it's clear how the, 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 the trend is increasing. And the, uh, unfortunately, the latest um, number is 420 ppm in February 2023, as we are talking. And uh, comparing that to 280 ppm uh, during the pre-industrial time, that's uh, a huge increase. So this increase actually is causing uh, so much warming, as we all know, uh, warming uh, in the atmosphere, but also in the uh, sea, in the, the sea surface temperature. This is actually uh, increasing uh, the, the CO2 concentrations also in the, in the ocean because the ocean is functioning as the uh, lungs of our uh, planet in general. So not only the forest, but also the ocean. And uh, this lung is taking more and more uh, CO2 in it. And because of that, and after the absorption of the excessive CO2, there are many chemical reactions that are happening in the ocean. And because of that, the chemistry of the ocean is changing and the pH is decreasing, which is called ocean acidification. This is not uh, only observed in one station, but in many uh, areas around the world. So this is something global. Okay, and uh, so that's the, the, the ocean acidification. So what, why, why we are interested in that? So uh, in general, uh, the, the, uh, our uh, marine ecosystems and the marine, uh, the different um, marine ecosystems are, are facing direct anthropogenic pressures, climate change related consequences. And this has actually many consequences and effects on marine biology. So first, 
We, we know that the basic direct anthropogenic pressures like terrestrial runoff, nutrients input and pollution, but also the emission of CO2 that are causing many climate change related consequences like deoxygenation, warming, the change of the circulation patterns, the sea level rise that many um, speakers, many colleagues have already mentioned as well. And this is causing huge effects on um, uh, modifications in the trophic uh, relationships, impacts on biodiversity and nursery effects, etc. So ocean acidification specifically, because it's increasing the hydrogen ions in the, in the, in the sea, and this is um, uh, causing huge damages on uh, many uh, marine groups that are actually relying on the presence of carbonate ions in order to build their shells and skeletons. Like, for example, foraminifera, like the mussels we eat, etc. And these are uh, called like key species that are uh, very important to, to, to build and to, to complement the marine trophic chain. So, uh, and the projections are not really uh, good because it, it's, we, it's expected that we will have um, uh, acidified water by an increase in the acidified, uh, acidified water by 70% uh, by the mid century. So, uh, in 2050, and 130% by the end of the century. This is, this is a huge. Uh, it's a huge and it has many repercussions actually on our resources. Like for example, in the Mediterranean, we are already seeing coral bleaching and other um, effects. So why is that important for a country like Pakistan? So Pakistan is an important maritime state. It has a huge economic, exclu exclu exclusive economic zone. And its, um, its maritime sector is very important for the national economy of the country. And it has, as uh, uh, my colleague Josh also has mentioned, that it has huge mangrove forests, uh, which could um, actually help so much in the strategies of not only adaptation, but also mitigation of different climate change consequences. And uh, observing uh, ocean acidification is thus E for such a country in order to better be prepared for uh, ocean acidification repercussions and climate change consequences in, in general. So to maintain stability in the blue economy sector, uh, uh, whether it is in the aquaculture and building uh, infrastructure, etc., uh, we have to know what do we have exactly. So the physical features, the chemical features, the biological features in the country, and we have to know what's happening. So what are the drivers of change? So when we know what are exactly the drivers of change, let's say, for example, the patterns of warming, the patterns of ocean acidification, sea level rise, pollution trends, etc., then we can actually determine better solution uh, for short and long term um, strategies. So we need ocean observations uh, for ocean acidification monitoring, but also other climate change consequences. So ocean acidification is a global condition with local effects, and that's why we uh, are part in general, many researchers working on ocean acidification of the global ocean acidification observing network. It's go on. Uh, you can be part of that. So we were very few countries in 2013. And now we are more than 105 countries with more than uh, 900 scientists. And we uh, so much encourage uh, you, uh, colleagues, to be part of that network. It's a global network. So because this is a global phenomenon that we need to team up, actually, in order to, to better understand it, but also to um, uh, face it as well. So it is a global, um, uh, a, a global uh, threat. We need to understand it and its drivers correctly. We need to identify its patterns to collect sufficient data to develop uh, actually early, uh, early warning system and to develop better develop local and global policies uh, to, to fight it. So uh, how, how we've done that in the Mediterranean, for example. So we were like part of many cruises in the Mediterranean where we were able to take the samples and to analyze uh, 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 the seawater there in order uh, to, to better understand. So that was like cruises um, established or conducted by different Mediterranean countries because one country cannot actually understand what's happening alone. So we need like to team up the resources. And so 
we better uh, understood what's happening in terms of sequestration of anthropogenic CO2, the, the variation of pH uh, since pre-industrial era uh, till now, etc. So uh, I'm, I'm going to give a bit of example of Lebanon, what we've done in the National Center of Marine Sciences in Lebanon in this term, just like uh, trying to be a little bit inspirational. So in, the, in, the, in Lebanon, we didn't know at all before 2012 what's happening in terms of climate change trends, patterns, biogeochemical patterns, ocean acidification. So we decided actually to like uh, choose time series stations there in the area and to, to uh, sample these time series stations monthly. So it, it is a very small puzzle in the Mediterranean, but it's very important to close the gaps of knowledge and to better understand at long term what's happening. And so we, we were taking samples for different physical chemical parameters, like the basic ones, temperature, salinity, nitrate, nitrite, phosphate, uh, biomass like chlorophyll A, phytoplankton, zooplankton, but we also added uh, carbonate system parameters that are critical in order to understand ocean acidification like total alkalinity, total dissolved inorganic carbon, pH, etc. And we were able since 2012 to know the pattern of the different parameters. So how seasonally they are varying to the trend, actually these parameters in order to get the uh, annual trends. So we were able to identify that the total alkalinity and total dissolved inorganic carbon are increasing in our area in Lebanon, in the Mediterranean, and that the pH, there, there is a clear and significant decreasing trend of pH acidification, in other words, in the Mediterranean, like in, uh, in many areas uh, around the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, a decrease of calcite and aragonite calcium carbonate uh, ions that are really very important for lots of marine groups. So, uh, but as a country, we are not able to do that and to understand alone. We need actually to complement this puzzle with other countries as well and with other groups that are doing the same. So we can actually interpret our results uh, in a better way because it's local, but also it's global. So that's why in the Mediterranean, for in the globally, um, in terms of Goa on the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, we have many regional hubs. We are teaming up together. We are connecting together in order to um, better interpret and know what's happening and to identify the gaps in each hub in each area, etc. The OA Med Hub is one of these regional hubs. So how to do that for, for, for example, an area like in the Indian Ocean? So we have, first of all, to agree on the importance of the area. So uh, the importance, the economic importance. In Pakistan, we have lots of, uh, 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 lots of interest and potentials in terms of a blue economy. So that's something really very important that can unite the colleagues there. But also we know that uh, this area is under multiple pressures. And that's how, that's how actually we were able to construct like uh, uh, a hub that's a, a formed of 14 countries, more than 82 uh, scientists. Uh, even if some countries had some political issues, etc., we tried to overcome the, this because we need really to team up together. So we have Lebanon, France, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Italy, Egypt, Morocco, but also other countries. We are trying to fight the gender uh, uh, balance in science but also the north, south gender. So we know who's doing what. We know actually how to identify ways of collaboration in terms of projects, cruises, etc. But also to identify labs for the certified reference materials because that's needed to have uh, more adequate and precise ocean acidification measurements. And we are doing like webinars together in order also to publish our results. So. This Mediterranean hub is a UN voluntary commitment, so we are trying to uh, comment and to communicate actually our results to policymakers 
And that's how also we have done the first systematic review for the area. And this can, can be actually replicated wherever. So we were teaming up together and trying to, 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 to use the resources of the uh, IAEA, the International Atomic Agency, uh, in order to collect data uh, and studies related to ocean acidification and uh, to better understand the evolution of ocean acidification studies in the, in the Mediterranean, but this can be done also in the Indian Ocean and other areas to know what is the type of studies that has been evolving in terms in function of time, with what are the countries that are the most productive in terms of ocean acidification and the least ones? So we can boost, we can check how to uh, how to uh, uh, support the countries that are not able to really be involved in the ocean acidification research and why exactly and who's actually working also internationally in the Mediterranean Sea. So we know also, for example, what combinations and chemical combinations are they are um, using. This is very critical because we wanted to know if the combinations used are really scientifically good or not. So to give recommendations, what are the um, uh, uh, biological groups that are the most studied, but also the least studied in order to give recommendations. So in the next 10 years, during the uh, UN Ocean Decade, what to study now, maybe to focus more on microbes, on foraminifera, etc. cetera. And uh, so to, to check if the researchers are doing single stressor or multi-stressor experimentations, etc. So what I want to say here is that also we have a new hub in, in the area, so close to Pakistan. Pakistan is actually involved in that uh, hub, Sarawa, it's called, South Asia Regional Hub on Ocean Acidification. So this hub has been emerged because uh, the, the area, the South and Southeast Asia is a hotspot for coastal biotopes. And many uh, uh, of the colleagues have already mentioned the huge amount of resources there from mangroves and other uh, uh, key ecosystems. So it is needed actually to work together and to team up together. And uh, the blue economy sector is one of the main sectors that, that are emerging in that area uh, uh, actually. And so uh, ocean acidification, unfortunately, is threatening uh, uh, these, um, uh, let's say, the, uh, the essential components of a blue sector and blue, blue economy relying on marine resources in that area. And that's why it's really very important to start observing systematically this phenomenon in Pakistan and in the neighboring countries. So this is a, a established, um, it's, very new. It has a steering committee. It was an idea, and now it's it's really it has a steering committee. As I've said, it has a clear objectives, and Pakistan is one of the countries. It has very few, um, uh, just a couple of colleagues from Pakistan, but uh, hopefully more and more will be joining together to team up with other colleagues from the area and to create. Uh, like a platform of communication and collaboration between the different uh, 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 colleagues there in order to better understand together the ocean acidification and its reper repercussions. So uh, there are many ongoing activities that uh, I don't think uh, I have time to, 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 to say it. But what I want to say is that climate change consequences know no boundaries. So we have to collaborate to save the future of our seas and resources, regional hubs, like uh, the OAMED hub in the Mediterranean, but Sarawa also in the uh, South and South, Southeast uh, Asia, they are crucial to understand local ocean acidification trends and effects. Thus, we need to team up together. And time series monitoring is key because through time series observations, we are able to really identify patterns and to differentiate between natural and uh, non-natural variabilities and to better assess if there are effects or not on marine ecosystems um, due to ocean acidification or other stressors. 
So we need to implement the UN, the existing UN uh, Sustainable Development Goal 14.3, which is essential for protecting communities and livelihoods from the threat of changing uh, sust to, to sustain the blue economy. This is really a critical. And I would really recommend that you join Goa on and its regional hubs and be part of our uh, Ocean Acidification International communities. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, these are also my emails later on. Thank you. Thank you, Abed. Thank you, Do Dr. Abed. I, I hope you will uh, stay with us uh, to take questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to our third speaker. Uh, we have Professor Wuing uh, with, with us uh, today. Uh, professor Wuing uh, is a professor of uh, biogeochemistry at the State Key Laboratories for Estuarine and Coastal and Estuarine uh, Research. Uh, she works for the East China Normal University. She's a SSC member of IMBER, uh, which is the Integrated Marine Biogeochemistry and Ecosystem Research, which is a consortium of scientists from all over the world. Uh, she's been associated with that since 2016. She's a full member of the SCORE Working Group 161. Uh, SCORE, I'm sure you all all aware, is the Scientific Commission for Oceanographic Research. Uh, Pakistan is also a member. Uh, her research is primarily focused on composition and biogeochemistry of organic matter from the source to the sink using isotopes and biomarkers. Uh, of trace uh, sources. She also studies fluxes and cycles and transform, uh, transformation in the natural environment. Uh, Professor Wuing and her group, uh, scientific group, has been associated with the National Institute of Oceanography since uh, uh, 2012, and we continue to work. She has been uh, uh, awarded uh, several international uh, excellent talent awards, uh, Humboldt's Experience Fellow Awards, and many more. Uh, we are very honored to have uh, Professor Wuing visiting us. This is her first trip to Pakistan. We hope this is going to continue and she's going to keep uh, coming to Pakistan and, uh, uh, and uh, we will benefit from her experience and her uh, expertise. Uh, I will now uh, now request her to please uh, take the podium and uh, talk to us. Thank you, thank you, Samina. Um, uh, I'm so excited, I would say. Um, respect the chief uh, guests and respect the DG of NIMA, um, distinguished guests and officers, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is my uh, first trip to Pakistan, which I'm longing for, for a long time ago. Um, I'm great honored to be here and exciting meeting and I meet a lot of nice person and uh, wonderful experts. Um, here, I'm gonna um, take uh, the, you know, uh, I'm not alone. I will uh, be on half of my uh, whole group to uh, share our knowledge and the lessons we have learned from Chinese uh, uh, rivers and coasts to talking about the sustainability of rivers and coasts and their links to the blue economy. Hope uh, we can share those uh, uh, knowledge together. Uh, I will not repeat why the blue economy means a lot for the uh, developing country because we have learned a lot from uh, yesterday's lecture and also today's. Uh, but as an oceanographer, I would love to remind all of us to think about one uh, uh, important issue when we are considering the development, we always have to think about how to make the balance between the development and uh, uh, the sustainability sustainable of the resources in the oceans. And the figures just showed, uh, based on the most recent review, the literature they uh, uh, conducted 10 years, uh, you know, uh, aesthetic analysis, they showed the SDG goals as I most uh, uh, people live, uh, sit in this room has uh, uh, listened these words of several times. It's kind of, you know, UN uh, uh, decade of uh, um, uh, oceans uh, implementation plan has been launched since 
2021, which aims to you know make uh, the uh, ocean health and the sustainability. Uh, also could be the top priority task for the um, for the older ocean um, ocean nations research uh, in the coming 10 years so they they found there's a great link between sdg goals and uh, uh, the blue economy tasks so which means we have to be very careful for this kind of issue. So the most uh, uh, linked issue will be uh, target uh, uh, 17 14, 12, and 15. So which, if we ex uh, explain a little more, the will be linked to the life on the water and the life on the, uh, on the terrestrial environment, uh, which obviously is linked to our topic today. Uh, we have learned a lot, even um, Ben Fodder for the uh, uh, Senate's talks. Uh, she mentioned that uh, the coastal system is really uh, uh, vulnerable for all kinds of you know, stresses, including the climatic change, sea rise, and uh, also the anthropogenic disturb. So we could say there's a there are serious uh, ecological risk that has to be interfered for our systems. So there's a two plots. The left plot just give you the information about uh, eutrophication and uh, uh, hypoxia has observed in the Asia region. So we are ashamed that Shanghai, um, the Chinese coastal system has a lot of dots and uh, that means they have a kind of a uh, serious problem. We have uh, less dots around uh, in the uh, in, along the Pakistan coastline at this moment, but I maybe need more efforts to to make sure and elucidate. So the ref, the right um, picture just give the ideas about the red tide events observed in the last ten years. You will see so many you know circles represented independent events in each year, and they are covering the most coastal regions which will interfere our ecosystem health very, very much. So the um, review paper just uh, elucidated that eutrophication in the coastal region become a big issue. And almost over 20% area of the coastal region has been definitely affected by the eutrophication. Uh, major region is the, uh, about the nitrogen enrichment in these systems. So those uh, nitrogen most uh, derived from the uh, terrestrial environment is through the river system. So I will uh, give uh, the more detailed information one by one uh, later. And uh, the additional sources uh, besides the uh, river and road will be atmospheric deposition and also the SGD, the submarine groundwater discharges. Uh, Yellow River is the most uh, northern large river in China, so they are also quite a highly dense the region. And uh, uh, the picture on the left side it just gave you the idea about uh, the you know the the nutrient uh, loads and their forms uh, in the past uh, 18 years. So uh, based on this kind of long, uh, long term records, we can notice that uh, since 2012, we setting the very strict legacy in the, uh, in, in the, on the land. So that's why you see the kind of a sharp decline of neutral road in the river. But uh, if you notice the, the last, uh, uh, Last picture on the bottom. So they, they notice the DOP, the organic uh, phase of the phos phosphorus, uh, just uh, you know increase in the different trends. And uh, the right picture to give you about the algae bloom um, uh, eutrophication event record in the Bohai, that's the Jensen Sea, um, you know, beside the Yellow Sea. But you see, they are not uh, coupling. That means the riverine road is uh, decreasing but you couldn't see the eutrophication event records decreasing as in trends. So, which means there's a lot of, you know, mechanism or kind of, you know, process still missing and we need to more uh, investigation behind it. Uh, here, that's the uh, example from the uh, Changjiang, uh, maybe people sometimes will call Yance. 
um, they are, um, it's the longest river in China and also famous for the Surgarges Dam built on the upstream so people. So that's why we monitored the system very carefully. We uh, carried out the several, uh, you know, uh, basin scales investigation. Uh, that's the plots uh, based on the 40 years records. And uh, on the right panel, you will see the time a uh, high resolution time series data we collect in the downstream of the river, which give you the based on the monthly data to evaluate uh, the signal more properly. Uh, the purpose is uh, uh, we just try to divide the signal of the climate change into the, um, uh, you know, um, into uh, to divide in, uh, to beside the, um, as a potential disturb. So we will see uh, the nitrogen load has uh, increased almost five to f uh, four to five folds in 40 years, and the phosphorus even, even severe will be eight folds. But uh, the dam effect seems not so significant interfere the silica, uh, uh, silica case. And uh, we just calculated the, how the uh, sub-region of the basin to interfere the different uh, nutrients uh, of loading. And uh, we found uh, for the most uh, highly dense uh, urbanization processed uh, region, the, the uh, Yant Delta, they found they only contributed 5% of the whole ginger basin, but contributed 20% DIP, the phosphorus load in the whole systems, which means urbanization could play a very significant role in, you know, in, in such kind of uh, river and, uh, nitrogen loadings estimations, which is ignored in the previous studies. And the statistical analysis also elucidated the there's a very limited role in climate change effects. And the major roles is become from the land use change and also the, um, the, uh, the urbanization uh, processes. Um, last case is, uh, that's the most southern river, which is close to Guangzhou. I guess um, some Pakistan and colleagues have been visited there. Uh, so there's a, a Kupur River. And there are also similar uh, case in the Yans, uh, a highly eutrophicated influence for the whole estuary. Um, as I mentioned uh, in the uh, few slides ago, the SGD play a kind of important role. It's uh, um, it's kind of you know new studies carried. Uh, it's not really really new already. So almost uh, twenty years, twenty years going already. So we found uh, uh, besides the riverine road, uh, SGD plays a more and a more important uh, role for the riverine uh, nutrients loading, uh, according to the uh, review paper published just recently. They elucidated uh, based on uh, uh, their observation, almost 60% uh, of the worldwide coastline, the SGD load is even bigger than rivers. And especially, they have a special form of their nutrients patterns, just like they will have enriched in ammonium and organic nutrients, which are more, um, you know, more distinguished uh, impact on the uh, aquatic systems. So, based on those knowledge, we will see kind of you know um, action, urgent action must be taken to reduce those uh, nutrients loading from the terrestrial environment into the ocean. But before we, uh, you know, design such kind of management, we should uh, uh, keep one, you know, one thing very clearly. Um, in long term, we simply use the uh, single system nutrient control um, you no know, discipline, but it will be not really work well. So the four plots uh, uh, we presented here is the nice paper publishing science by the American, I think, the American scientist. They mentioned uh, that's the normal case. You will observe the the phosphorus um, uh, limitation in the riverside, and you will see the nitrogen limitation in offshore region. 
but uh, if they have the different uh, ecological risks, just uh, pay attention to the bottom, the hypoxia events uh, happen in the different position, means you have to take the different uh, regulation of nutrient control, uh, nutrient c control um, actions later, so which means a more detailed and a decent study should be uh, carried out. I briefly discussed with Samina about the Indus Delta issue, uh, more or less uh, adopt to the uh, case three, which means the nitrogen load should be uh, careful uh, controlled uh, in Pakistan um, Pakistan systems. Uh, I will um, take a kind of a nice exam, um, nice examples, but uh, unfortunately adopted to the lake system, how they, uh, um, you know, design a kind of special technology to, um, to prevent or to control the, uh, this kind of eutrophic, uh, eutrophication risks. So they applied uh, a kind of exper experiments in the Taihu Lake, which is located in the downstreams of the uh, Delta region of the Yans. Uh, there's, a, there's a nice place, and, uh, but um, unfortunately they have a very severe cyanobacteria bloom every spring and uh, uh, summertime. Uh, they, but uh, the scientists, they are smart enough. They, they changed those cyanobacteria, um, you know, to, to into the uh, carbon hydrate rich material, then fermented them. And uh, later they produced the ethanol, which are kind of a biorefinery raw material. So could it be a kind of, you know, idea, a way to, you know, develop a new technology to uh, reduce such kind of risk. Um, I guess my time is limited, so I would just you know, go directly to say uh, this kind of eutrophication cannot be avoided, and especially coupling with the climate change, uh, obviously they will go in with us for at least decades. So the solution and protocols should be definitely you know, designed and managed, and to, in, to maintain the system and the sustainability of those systems also will be very helpful for our blue economy. And there are several protocols I would love to share here. The first is the more strict legacy about the terrestrial nutrient pollutants release. And the second is give the, you know, restored the coastal wetlands and the mushroom ecosystems uh, ecological values and uh, make the, they are more valuable for filtration and uh, preventing, so make it our coastline more healthy. And the third one is uh, um, we should uh, remember the, those rivers is also kind of a nursery grounds for uh, those love shrimps and the fisheries. So we have to guarantee they are well functioned and uh, to make the, their nursery and then migration easy and free. Uh, the last one we always have to um, remember and also what my more closely linked to the blue economy development, because I guess uh, similar as the, in the Chinese uh, uh, coastline will be happened uh, also in the Pakistan coastline. There's a lot of new projects going on because uh, in China, I think uh, recently we have a lot of uh, wind, uh, marine wind power construction on the coastline, but I guess there's the ecological risk is not really well uh, evaluated at the moment. Uh, finally, I will not uh, repeat the sentence that I've shown in the slides, but I would love to share the address. Uh, I will cite the address uh, about uh, from our uh, chairman uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, he has uh, mentioned the, the lucid monk, uh, the lucid water and the, um, the lush um, mountain uh, means invalid assets in Chinese will be. Uh, so that's kind of a way to convince us sustainable, um, sustainably of the rivers and coasts means a lot for the human beings, also for the blue economy. We have to work together to, uh, for our better future. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We'll take the questions to the end, and with that, we come to the last speaker, which is myself, who is myself. 
So um, I will I will try not to exceed the time that's allocated to me. And uh, uh, I promise you my presentation is not that scientific so that uh, it doesn't put you to sleep. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the last speaker of the session, Dr. Samina Kidwai. She will present her talk on ocean research priorities in Northwest Indian Ocean region. Okay. Can we have the, the presentation on, please? Um, I would like to thank Nima, uh, DG Nima, uh, Director Nima Karachi, for uh, giving us uh, the National Institute of Oceanography uh, the floor uh, for uh, one of the sessions, a sub-session, and giving us the opportunity to share some of the work that my organization is carrying out. I think this should be a small window into some of the works that we are doing and uh, perhaps uh, invite uh, some of the, our national colleagues and international colleagues to come and collaborate with us. So you are most welcome to reach out to us uh, either through our emails or uh, if, you, uh, if you see us, any, uh, myself or any of my colleagues, uh, you can just catch me there and talk to me. So I'm quite open with that. So with that, uh, we will begin um, my presentation today. Uh, we are going to look at the priorities for the Northwest Indian Ocean. Uh, you've looked at some of the global, some of the things that have been spoken uh, about by uh, our uh, very valuable speakers uh, yesterday and today, and uh, for our session also. Uh, so I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of details and how that contributes to the blue economy. And like I said, that uh, the research has to come uh, before the development. And you can only uh, do sustainable uh, development if you are uh, knowledgeable about how, uh, how your uh, uh, systems are going to react. So uh, for the scope, uh, uh, we've all looked at how global oceans are, are all connected and uh, uh, we look at what the region is about. Uh, we will also look at uh, the, o the ocean and human nexus, how the hum humanity is connected to the oceans. Uh, then we will look out uh, into, uh, into how, uh, uh, what are the research drivers for the region and uh, what our, our organization is doing. Uh, global oceans, uh, there is a connection. I think uh, Senator Sherry Rahman, she explained the conveyor belt very, uh, very clearly to everyone. Uh, the conveyor belt uh, takes about a thousand years to take one uh, round. So with uh, the conveyor belt uh, slowing down, um, obviously it's going to impact all the processes that are taking place in the environment in the oceans as well. So uh, our own region, we are the Northwest Indian Ocean, uh, the Arabian Sea. And you see that uh, there are no boundaries within the oceans. And like all my, um, the, the speakers before me have uh, uh, stressed uh, very um, clearly that uh, we all need to work together as a community uh, of ocean scientists. Um, the oceans uh, contribute uh, uh, food security, water security, uh, employment creation, and when we're talking about blue economy, employment is a huge uh, element there. Uh, climate regulation, uh, obviously the oceans uh, uh, contribute hugely to the climate uh, regulations, and we've, um, we've had many speakers uh, dwell on that as well. Uh, nutrient cycles, we've had um, uh, Professor Wuing talk about the nutrient cycles, uh, how important the nitrogen, phosphorus and silicates and carbons are uh, for the oceans and how uh, productivities are driven through these uh, cycles. Uh, habitats and biodiversity, we've been looking at that and um, our, our colleague from Malaysia spoke about uh, 
about the coral reefs this morning, then we had the mangroves. So there are many, many uh, ecosystems that are extremely important to us for maintaining biodiversity and uh, conserving them and habitats. Uh, tourism, of course, is one of the other elements, How, but obviously like uh, our, uh, the speaker uh, talking about the coral reefs uh, mentioned that uh, the tourism has, uh, tourism has to be sustainable as well. So that it, uh, uh, the, the ecosystem that it is uh, actually addressing uh, has a carrying capacity and we must know uh, what is the carrying capacity of each of these habitats. Um, how humans are pressurizing, overfishing, climate change, ocean acidification, pollution, um, sustain, unsustainable usage of uh, some of the coastal areas. Uh, and of course, uh, resource extraction as well. So uh, we had someone uh, speak about, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Engineer Faisal who spoke about how uh, the last stock assessment of uh, Pakistan suggested that 80% of these stocks have depleted and 50% of the fishing fleets sh uh, should be cut off. I think he's very, uh, very uh, uh, clear on that and the report is, uh, is available for, any, uh, for anyone to see. Uh, we, when we suggest uh, that we have huge potential, uh, we must look at uh, how our resources and where our resources stand uh, before we uh, get into those kind of uh, uh, comments. Uh, the key challenges, of course, is to beat marine pollution, uh, is to protect and restore uh, ecosystems. Um, of course, we have to feed uh, a large population. Pakistan has a large population and it keeps growing. So uh, we have to make sure that the protein deficiency is addressed. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, climate change uh, related um, issues as well. Um, now, the, the, the elements that are driving uh, ocean research at the moment are the, that the United Nations declared the current decade as the decade of the oceans for sustainable development. And uh, the elements that are very clear in that is that we are able to address and measure and, rest and keep uh, uh, working towards uh, an integrated approach. So I think that's where we stand. The global community needs to work together in order to, and I think the Aman has been a huge, uh, uh, huge uh, inspiration uh, if uh, the navies can work together, why can't the scientists work together? So I think uh, uh, that's a huge inspiration for us. Um, the, uh, Pakistan is obviously also part of the UN IOC, so therefore we also are uh, focusing our, uh, our uh, research towards the UN decade uh, of the oceans. Uh, we are also uh, quite uh, clearly focused towards the Sustainable Development Goal 14. Um, ocean acidification is one of the elements under this uh, and Pakistan is doing that. And let me also tell you, and I will of course uh, show you some of the work that uh, our organization has been involved in, uh, in which uh, in the earlier reports that were going out from Pakistan on ocean acidification, we would just leave those uh, sections blank. Now, but we are measuring those, uh, those we're taking those observations from the last uh, few years. Uh, and so we are quite proudly not, not leaving those, uh, those sections blank anymore. And we are filling them uh, with uh, data that's collected at my organization. Uh, uh, NIO's initiatives, of course, is to mobilize the scientists, uh, synthesize the existing research that's taking place. Uh, we are also in uh, reaching out to all the other stakeholders. We are bridging uh, science policy and uh, societal dialogues. We think that this is our, our being here at the PIMEC is, is, uh, should, uh, should reflect uh, that we are uh, reaching out uh, to all and everyone uh, in society. We are, uh, we think we also that uh, we sh science should be uh, for a purpose and not just to uh, serve uh, uh, curiosity. So there should be real solutions to problems also. So I think uh, unless we do that and reach out to the industry, there's no way that the scientists can know what the problems are and uh, how to solve them. 
Uh, like I said, that the National Institute of Oceanography uh, is working towards the ocean decade. We are uh, trying to improve our uh, research capacity by, uh, by uh, improving our human resource, uh, by upgrading our facilities uh, and, uh, and improving uh, all the, uh, and strengthening uh, our technical and scientific manpower or uh, human power. So uh, we are, the National Institute of Oceanography has been working towards uh, getting a sea going platform for many years since the beginning. Uh, we cannot go out to measure as regularly as Dr. Abed said, uh, we need to establish time series stations uh, unless we have our own platform. That uh, is, uh, is a dream that uh, we are still hoping uh, will materialize in the future. Uh, we, we also want to improve our uh, national and international visibility and as a scientist I feel that uh, for the international visibility our research will do that for us, for the national visibilities we are here part of the PIMEC so that we become, uh, we as uh, our organization and our work uh, becomes more visible to the Pakistanis and to, to other visitors and international visitors who are coming to this exhibition and the conference. Uh, we are part of many international programs, uh, one or two I'm going to show you. Uh, national collaborations, we have several projects that are going on and we have international partner, uh, national partners in that. We, have, we work very closely with the hydrography department. Our founding director was a hydrographer um, and he had a huge vision for the organization and I think uh, uh, from the day one, we have been working very closely with Pakistan Navy. So uh, Pakistan Navy is uh, a huge uh, support for us. Uh, MSA, we've signed a MOU with them. Uh, hydrography, we have an MOU with them also. Uh, other than that, we have PCRWR, which is the Water Resource uh, Council. Uh, Suparco, we do remote sensing as well uh, and remote sensing applications that uh, cater to marine, uh, the, to the marine side. Uh, so we work very closely with them as well. Academia, of course, we get uh, a lot of collaborative uh, and joint research projects uh, with them. We've uh, signed several MOUs with many universities uh, and we support their students and their uh, research staff. For the international, okay. I was used, I was told to use the left, okay. Okay, for the international collaborations, we have many international collaborations with China, uh, with Germany, with the United States. We are part of the SCORE. We are part of the INOC, which is the Islamic Network of Oceanographic uh, uh, Committee. We are part of SCAR, which is the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research. We are part of UNESCO IOC. Um, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. We are part of the subcommittee, which is covering IOCINDIO, Central Indian Ocean. Uh, we are also part of the Mega Delta program, which is a collaboration that we have with uh, the state key laboratories of Estuarine and Coastal Research, uh, East China Normal University. Uh, so uh, uh, many international collaborations. Okay, uh, I'm not going. To, I'm going to skip this because it, I've already said uh, some things about this. Okay, this is something that I would like to say. Uh, the National Institute of Oceanography has two sources of funding. One is the funds that the government uh, provides through its non-development, and we do our in-house research through that, in which uh, scientists uh, submit their proposals, and we we, fat, we get money to do. Uh, some of the works. Uh, the other source is the PSDP, the Public Sector Development Projects, uh, which is uh, project-driven uh, money that's provided to us. Uh, we are, let's go back. Uh, we are quite interested right now, and we're looking at and, and, and monitoring the Argo floats that are entering the Pakistani waters. And a few, a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week, uh, we had uh, four Argo floats uh, from France in our waters, and we are now tracking these Argo floats uh, that are uh, online in uh, real time. Uh, we, um, I think uh, Dr. Zafrullah spoke um, uh, quite in detail about the MSP, 
uh, we too are very interested in the MSP. We think this is the way to go forward. And uh, the National Institute is also engaged in some of the work on MSP. We are looking at potential fishing zones uh, through remote sensing and through, uh, uh, through some of the oceanographic observations that we're doing. Acquisition of the ship is also extremely important to us. Uh, the two PSDP projects that we are cu currently running is one on the sea level rise, uh, seawater intrusion and land subsidence uh, in the coast of Pakistan. Uh, this is a five-year project. We are already in the third year of it, acquiring data. Uh, this is a 730 million uh, park rupee project. Uh, we have acquired some very sophisticated observatories uh, that we have established at our four stations, our main head office and the three substations that we have. Uh, in Gwadar, Somyani, and Ghorabari. So we have tidal observatories, weather stations, GNSs at two of the stations, and a tidal observatory at Fish Harbor of Gwadar. So we are doing quite a bit of this work as well. Uh, for the other project, uh, which was the South of Balochistan Development uh, Initiative uh, project, this is to um, to strengthen our Gwadar substation and. Uh, uh, NIO has been engaged with, uh, in research since 1987 in Gwadar. Uh, we have our substation on the East Bay, and we are trying to, uh, under this project, uh, strengthen this, uh, expand the, the, the infrastructure, improve our uh, capacity in terms of uh, observatories, etc. This could also be a delegated Park China Marine Research Center. So uh, we have our colleagues uh, from the Second Institute of Oceanography in China who are quite interested to be part of this uh, program as well. Um, this project is an international project in which NIO, there are five main labs uh, all, uh, all over the world uh, in, uh, in which we are looking at five of the mega deltas of the world. Uh, Indus was recognized uh, amongst those 15 uh, major de deltas. And uh, this program is uh, under the Ocean Decade program, is, has recognition from that. And we are also, uh, th uh, this is also an affiliated project of the Future Earth program. So um, NIO and Pakistan contributes to this uh, as well. Um, like uh, uh, Dr. Abed mentioned, uh, we too are part of an international group that is measuring eutrophication, ocean acidification, and primary production. Uh, this is an al alumni project uh, with uh, 13 countries participating in which Pakistan, since the last two years, has been contributing. We have five stations all along uh, our, uh, our coast in where, where we are measuring nutrient levels, uh, salinities, primary production, chlorophyll, ocean acidification, which is total alkalinity and, and uh, pH values, and also uh, uh, looking at primary production. So uh, we are now part of this network that uh, measures this for, uh, for a global synthesis. And I has a plan. Um, uh, this year, um, very soon, I think in a couple of uh, weeks time, we, some of you may get in, in, invited uh, for a consultative uh, workshop on reactivation of the Antarctic program of Pakistan. We think that in a, since there were 10 uh, uh, different um, institutions that were involved in the two Antarctic expeditions, uh, the National Institute of Oceanography can be the lead but cannot be the only stakeholder in this program. So I think we need to get to a consensus where, where we uh, decide on a, on a collective uh, a forum whether uh, Pakistan wants to reactivate. And if you reactivate, then you will have to go for a national policy because then you will have to make a long time commitment. Otherwise, you will end up with uh, the 30 year gap that we are currently facing. So uh, that's one thing. Uh, 
our uh, seawater intrusion project. Uh, very soon we will have our conference with more scientific papers published in uh, and presented in that conference. We are also planning um, our uh, research vessel project uh, was submitted to the CPEC. 17 projects from the uh, Ministry of Science and Technology were submitted. Three were uh, selected and shortlisted and, and uh, two of them were from NIO and we decided that we would go with just one from NIO which is the research vessel, because we cannot grow unless we have the vessel. There can be no oceanography if we don't have the platform. So I think we, that, that is something that we will take forward, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, other than that, uh, our remote sensing uh, uh, project, uh, the, our Chinese colleagues are quite interested. Our ministry signed an MOU with them also uh, to establish this remote sensing uh, station, a receiving station. Uh, in Pakistan to carry out marine applications. So that's uh, another thing in the pipeline. Uh, we are in December uh, this year, inshallah ta'ala, uh, if, uh, if uh, Allah ta'ala wills, uh, we will be carrying out a winter school also for observational oceanography. For those of uh, us uh, who are interested, we'll, we'll go to, I am going to get, <laughs> you don't need to give me that slip. Okay, and I has many, many plans and uh, this is something that uh, I wanted to and needed to share with you. And with that, uh, we will thank you very much for your attention and, and your patience. And I don't want to keep you any and hold you anymore because I think you've had a very long day. Thanks very much for your very kind hearing. Uh, for all my speakers, um, uh, I, if, uh, if, if I can just open the floor for a question and answer, just so that because a session requires a question and answer, uh, we can take not questions from us because you can uh, talk to us anytime, but the, the, uh, the two uh, speakers that are online, uh, it's only fair that we allow them that little time. So two or three minutes, not long comments, question and answers for Josh and uh, Abid. Okay, I don't see any questions coming. I think everyone's really tired. So uh, no more questions, then we will conclude the session for today. Thanks uh, so much for this opportunity. Uh, DG Nima, uh, Admiral Ahmed Said Saab, uh, Director Nima, uh, Ali Abbas Saab, and all his uh, wonderful team who've been really cooperative to us and have borne with us. So thanks a lot. Uh, with that, I will now uh, request our uh, guest of honor to uh, give us uh, some closing remarks and conclude the, the day. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmuduhu wa nusalli ala rasoolihil kareem. We come to the end of the today's proceedings with the very, very highly technology-oriented presentations I'm sure some of you must have uh, understood. I haven't. So uh, a lot of things that have to happen. Um, the best thing I can do is now is to shorten my speech or make no speech. So you're all very happy. In the uh, Since you've been in the morning, I'd like to praise my compliments to all those who are present at the so much of late hours of the day, having attended all the sessions here. All, all my applaud goes to all of you sitting here. I was wondering as to, I was wondering as to why I have been made a chief guest today, and what I found was that since I was attending all these sessions and sitting in the front row, the DG Nima thought I am the most keen person to be on the stage. Thanks a lot. Only uh, I'll finish it with the research work that all you are doing and I reminded me of a share from Lama Iqbal and uh, no meeting or no presentation is complete without his you know share. So those who are doing research work, the Lama at that time said, Koi qabil ho to hum shane kai dete hain, dhunne walon ko dunya bhi nai dete hain. So this all NIMA work is finding new resources, finding new knowledge, technology. I'd like to thank the DG and all the participants 
to have stayed back and listen to all all of the presentations thank you very much god bless you all thank you ladies and gentlemen now is the time for the souvenir presentation ceremony i would like to request the chief guest vice admiral retired irfan ahmed hilal e imtiaz military sitara e jurrat to acknowledge these team speakers by presenting them with conference souvenirs director general neema vice admiral retired ahmed saeed hilal e imtiaz military is also requested to join him for souvenir presentation ceremony